Good evening. Good evening and welcome. Welcome to Lebanon Valley College. Uh, tonight we're going to have the Constitution Day lecture, uh, whose title is The United States Constitution and the Values of an Open Society. I'm Louis Thane, the president of the college, and it's my honor to introduce our speaker, U.S. District Judge John E. Jones. Before I do so, I have two acknowledgments I'd like to make. The first is to thank the Busgan Lewis, uh, Busgan Davis, rather, uh, law firm for sponsoring uh, this event tonight, along with the college. Uh, we're grateful for your support and your commitment uh, to the Constitution and to the college. Thank you very much. And the second <clears throat> is to uh, Professor Philip Benish, the person who organized our symposium on Karl Popper and the Open Society, of which this lecture is a part. This symposium um, is truly an extraordinary gathering, and it's a, uh, uh, an in-depth examination of the work of a seminal and very relevant uh, philosopher, Karl Popper. Philip, thank you, and I want to lead us in a round of applause to say thank you. <laughs> Judge Jones is a native of Schuylkill County and was appointed in 2002 to his current position as a federal judge in the Middle District of Pennsylvania. He has presided over several high-profile and consequential cases dealing with fundamental rights guaranteed by our Constitution. The most well-known is the 2005 case Kitzmiller versus Dover School District. I'm sure we all remember that case. This was the first legal test of intelligent design as a scientific theory. Judge Jones ruled that intelligent design could not be separated from its religious roots and struck oh, down its inclusion. Are we all right? Um, that it could not be separated from its religious roots and struck down its inclusion in the school curriculum. The PBS program NOVA featured Judge Jones and the case in a two-hour NOVA special, which in 2008 won a Peabody Award. For his thoughtful and independent opinions, Judge Jones has received numerous honors, including the Pennsylvania Bar Association's first John Marshall Judicial Independence Award in 2006. He has been awarded an honorary doctorate from Dickinson College, his alma mater, and has been recognized by Dickinson School of Law as an outstanding alumnus. Time Magazine named him one of the 100 most influential people in the world in 2006. Judge Jones found himself exercising his independence in an opinion earlier this year overturning Pennsylvania's ban on same-sex marriage. In Whitewood versus Wolf, Judge Jones compared the struggle for marriage rights for homosexuals to the civil rights struggles of African Americans over the last 60 years. There are personal connections to Lebanon Valley College for Judge Jones. His sister-in-law, Sue Jones, is a senior member of our admission staff, and his daughter-in-law, Katie Zwiebel Jones, uh, is a 2012 grad. We are delighted to have you, Judge Jones, uh, with us tonight and any time you want to come to campus. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, it's my uh, great honor and pleasure to be uh, with you tonight. Thank you for that generous uh, introduction. Um, as, uh, as the uh, President said, I, I, I do have connections on this campus. I'm, I'm not a stranger here. Um, don't get here that often, but uh, I'm, I'm well connected uh, with uh, sister-in-law Sue and uh, daughter-in-law Katie. Um, uh, we even dragged uh, brother Jim, uh, Sue's wife, out. We don't, we don't get him out to these things very often, but uh, Jim's here so he can listen to his, uh, his older brother uh, tonight. Happy to have him uh, here as well. To Philip, thank you. Uh, Philip has taken exceedingly good, uh, taken exceedingly good, good care of me um, through this process, uh, almost to excess, uh, worrying about my needs and, and uh, wants, and. Uh, 
uh, that uh, that was fantastic, and I and I thank you for that uh, and all of your hospitality. And I uh, I echo what the president said about uh, the uh, my friends at Buzzgon uh, Davis, uh, who were so kind as to do the uh, reception where I met so many of you and and uh, some of the wonderful uh, Lebanon Valley students uh, tonight and had an opportunity to chat with uh, particularly some uh, pre law students and I hope I didn't discourage you from uh, pursuing a career. <laughs> A career in the law. It's a marvelous uh, career, and uh, I'm quite sure that you're going to do well. And, and hopefully, uh, I can give you a couple of words that, uh, or I've given you a couple of words that can that can help you. So thanks to all. Um, I recognize that uh, part of the uh, the the sort of symposium that we're in the midst of is not just Constitution Day, but the celebration of Karl Popper, and. Um, I'm the beneficiary, I will tell you, uh, as was noted, of a marvelous uh, liberal arts education I received just down the road at uh, Dickinson College. And uh, however, I freely confess uh, that I had to, um, when uh, Karl Popper was invoked, uh, I'm, I'm going to admit this to you, I had to head to that uh, all-purpose research assistant that's accessible to uh, so many of us, Google, uh, to check up on uh, uh, Karl Popper, because I, I, you know, he was in the recesses of, of uh, my mind, but, uh, but not prominent. Uh, he was obviously, as you well know, uh, a, a scholar and a, and a thinker of, of great renown, uh, enormously deep. Uh, I, I found uh, this passage uh, about Popper in, in Wikipedia, uh, again, that sometimes unreliable, but sometimes reliable. Uh, research assistant, and, and it said this about Popper. He was known for rejection of the classical inductivist views on the scientific method in favor of empirical falsification. Got that, everybody? <laughs> that was a little tough for me, uh, I'm, I'm going to admit. You know, I, I like this. I may not be the sharpest pencil in the drawer, but I've been on the bench for 12 years, practiced law for a long time. That was a little deep, and I thought, I'm not sure I can use that uh, <laughs> during the Const Constitution Day speech. However, I went on, looked a little further, and I noted uh, that, that Popper endorsed an open society. Uh, and, uh, and that's part of what I want to chat uh, with you about tonight, and, and specifically meld that idea into um, a, a chat about our Constitution. And, and within the Constitution, uh, the judicial branch, one of the three branches of government in which I am, I'm very privileged to, to serve. Popper said these words, we do not choose political freedom because it promises us this or that. We choose it because it makes possible the only dignified form of human existence the only form in which we can be fully responsible for ourselves. Well said, then, uh, and, and much more uh, palatable and understandable to this judge than the, the prior phrase about classical inductivist views. Uh, and I want to use that as a, as a springboard, uh, then, for, for some things that I, I'd like to share with you tonight. Um, let's talk about some personal experiences that I've had that the president touched on uh, a little bit and they they inform me these these experiences that I've had on the bench they trouble me um, uh, but productively they guide me to some uh, conclusions that I have about where we are as a people and and where we need to aim uh, for the future exactly uh, nine years ago this month uh, I had the privilege, as uh, the, the president said, of presiding over a case that in its time gained worldwide attention. That was the case, of course, of Kitzmiller versus Dover. And, and I'm, I'm cognizant that uh, for the students who are here tonight, you were um, at a much earlier point in your education and probably not, uh, not tuned in. We, we elders like to think everything is topical instantly and we like to reminisce and bore you to death. Uh, talking about the old times, uh, and I recognize for you, uh, those of you who are students here, that truly, those truly are the old times, uh, not so much for us. But for those who are uninitiated, uh, the, the brief executive summary is that a group uh, of parents sued a school board in Dover, Pennsylvania, which is uh, not that far from here. It's in uh, York County, uh, south of Harrisburg. 
The basis of the suit was that the school board had passed a policy uh, which uh, allowed a concept known as intelligent design to be introduced into the school curriculum by way of a statement that was read to the students. And the parents alleged that the reading of this statement and the reference to a book that was on deposit in the library uh, were violative of uh, the parents' First Amendment um, rights, notably, uh, and in particular, uh, the separation of church and state as set out in the Establishment Clause. It was a um, massive lawsuit that went on for months. It was tried over a six-week period, as I said, uh, in the fall of 2005. And uh, it was contentious. Uh, it was um, marvelous in many ways because it, the scientific uh, testimony was riveting. There are four or five books written about the case. Um, uh, there was a special, as was alluded to, uh, on NOVA and so on and so forth. But uh, in the end, um, for our purposes, uh, on December the 20th of 2005, I, in a 139-page uh, ruling, uh, struck down the policy, said that it violated the parents' First Amendment rights, and the uh, case was closed at that point. It was not appealed because the school board had been, uh, in the intervening months, replaced uh, the uh, school board members who had passed the policy uh, caused that almost to be a referendum in the subsequent election, and they were thrown out by the voters in addition to suffering a loss uh, in my courtroom. A at that time, I knew, of course, through the trial, it was extensively covered uh, uh, by, by the media, as I, as I mentioned, and I, and I knew that uh, the opinion, when it was issued, would not be everybody's favorite flavor, because after all, this is an enduring debate. It goes back to the great Scopes monkey trial in uh, Dayton, Tennessee in the mid-1920s. Um, we have a dichotomy in the United States between uh, creationism and, um, and between evolution, uh, or, or countering one, uh, counting one against the uh, other. And it, it endures. It's endured for all of the years since then. It endures today. There are people in this room, uh, quite possibly, who do not embrace the concept of evolution and who are tilted towards creationism, fine. That's uh, certainly your right uh, as citizens. But what I did not understand, I understood that I would take criticism, but I understood that people would disagree with the opinion. I did not understand uh, that in addition to some praise that I received, as was noted for the opinion, I would receive some searing criticism uh, lobbed at me from some of the prominent commentators of the day, some of whom are, many of whom are still around. Uh, Bill O'Reilly, uh, that night uh, during his uh, TV show called me a fascist uh, a judge. Uh, Ann Coulter, in a book that was published that spring, um, uh, that uh, largely gained press, interestingly enough, because she excoriated the widows of the uh, heroes, uh, the hero firemen of 9-11. Uh, actually, that book was substantially dedicated to the evolution creationism debate. She called me a hack uh, and said I didn't belong anywhere near the bench. The Reverend Pat Robertson went on his television show and lamented uh, that an arrogant federal judge, me, uh, had uh, rendered that decision and uh, said to the, the uh, citizens of Dover, Pennsylvania, who had uh, voted out their uh, school board members that they ought to be careful because a natural disaster uh, wrought by God might befall uh, that, uh, that uh, community. Uh, the community is still there, I hasten to note, and it was not taken out. All of them at, at one point or another, and many others who were critical of my decision, labeled me a judicial activist. Judicial activist. And, and I hadn't heard that phrase very much before then. I found it interesting. Uh, and, and, and somewhat disconcerting, but as I said, in the end, sort of illuminating. And I'll explain you know, why, uh, why this was the case. And, and of course, the Kitzmiller case was this witch's brew, or depending on your perspective, delightful combination of uh, cultural, political, religious, legal issues, uh, as, I, as I just uh, mentioned. And, and it, it had everything for everybody if you follow that kind of uh, thing. Most judges will toil their entire judicial careers and never have a case like that uh, on their, uh, on their uh, docket. So it was a true 
a culture war event, and it was, as I said, enlightening. And one of the things that it did is it, is it drove me to go out and talk about judicial independence uh, issues and the role of the judiciary. So I've been doing that at various times, some years more than others, uh, certainly more closer to the time of that case since uh, uh, 2006. So imagine my feelings uh, in July of 2013 uh, when um, uh, I was sitting in chambers uh, in Harrisburg uh, and, and I find out that a case that I knew was being filed because I'd heard about it on the radio that morning, and that was Whitewood uh, versus Wolf, then Whitewood versus Corbett, that that case had landed on my docket. It was as if lightning had struck twice, and I could not believe, <laughs> nor could my colleagues, because th these cases are assigned randomly. I'd like to tell you I got it because I'm so good, but that's not true. I received it uh, by random assignment that that case, featuring a frontal challenge to Pennsylvania's ban against same-sex marriage had landed uh, on my docket. Another culture war case, uh, and um, that led to the predictable questions, what would this guy, what would Jones do uh, with this, this new sort of interesting case? And what ensued, uh, as, as those of you who are Pennsylvanians uh, know, was a, a long period of, of litigation no trial, because in the end, the facts were essentially stipulated to as they should have been, because um, the, the uh, alleged harm was evident. The question was, was a legal uh, one. And in May of this year, uh, I rendered a decision in, in which I struck down the, the ban and also the non-recognition of, of out-of-state marriages. Uh, the governor of Pennsylvania, um, who I know is an alum of this, of this uh, college, uh, decided in, in his wisdom, and I, and I think ultimately it was wise, uh, not to appeal uh, the determination. And uh, the case today uh, stands, and, and there is no uh, uh, ban on same-sex marriages in, in uh, Pennsylvania. Once again, however, predictably, and I was ready for it this time because, you know, you, you, you go through this once and you know that it's coming, so I was, I was uh, sort of girding for battle. Uh, the critics had a field day. Uh, one particular critic uh, tends to be, I think, illustrative of, of the many uh, critics of my decision. A fellow by the name of Sam Rohr is a, a former Pennsylvania State Representative. I happened to know Sam years ago uh, and um, happened to have a reasonably uh, friendly relationship with him um, uh, as, uh, at the time that he ran for State Representative and during the time that he served. I was in uh, the governor's administration, the governor of Pennsylvania's administration. I hadn't seen him for a number of years. Uh, it turns out that Sam is the president of the uh, Pennsylvania Pastors Network and American Pastors Network, among other things that he does. Accusing me of violating God's law, Mr. Rohr said this, let's be clear, this ruling was made by one man, a federal district judge, unelected and unaccountable, politically appointed, never facing the voters, and never answering to the press. Many people in this position, when unrestrained by moral truth, perceive themselves to be above the law. Immediately I could guess that Sam and I were not friends anymore. That was it. <laughs> and other critics uh, went on and they, and they uh, you have to get up pretty early in the morning to keep up with me. And, Immediately, uh, other critics labeled me, what? An activist judge. Implicit, really, in Mr. Rohr's criticism is the same thing. So if you meld the experiences together, the sort of common salient feature in the two cases is that, that I, was, I was dubbed a, a, an activist uh, judge. Um, and it was curious, too, because uh, for, for those who don't know, uh, my background was Republican. I was appointed to this position by President George W. Bush. Uh, and, and it's interesting the way the press treats that. I thought my name had been changed from uh, Judge John Jones to Bush-appointed federal judge, because that's how we describe judges. Clinton appointed, Obama appointed, 
you know, what have you. And that's an interesting thing because it is meant to imply a, a bias. Well, it didn't really work there, did it? Uh, and I think, I think it shows a certain independence that is lost, uh, I would suggest, on, on, uh, on people. And, and so the pundits, uh, the, the most ardent critics, implied that federal judges should rule in a way that, that recognizes their benefactors, disregards the law and legal precedent in order to make uh, rulings uh, that uh, are consistent with a particular ideology, and essentially to uh, take one for the home team. Uh, and, and this I found to be an interesting uh, analysis and an interesting assumption on the part of, of uh, many. And, and, and it, is, it is interesting in particular because if you go back and you look at my cases, uh, I, I ruled based on established precedent, carefully crafted opinions, that, that in, in my view at least, uh, and in others, many others, I've, I've talked about my critics, but in many others, uh, were, were, were built on the, the principle of stare decisis, which is the legal principle that we have building blocks in the law and we, and we uh, have a progressive system that builds on, on uh, prior precedent. So uh, at the end of the day, uh, when, when we take these cases, I, I was sort of smacked clearly in the face with this stark realization that fueled by many um, so-called uh, pundits and thought leaders, uh, many of our fellow citizens really don't understand how judges uh, decide cases. And their worst fears about the judicial system are, are, are sort of stoked and fomented uh, by uh, the media, by, by certain media talking heads uh, who, who will do what they will do. And that we're not particularly, we don't want to be sometimes very eclectic consumers uh, of opinion. We're wedded to, to one particular viewpoint or another. And I'm, and I'm sorry to see that. And I'm also sorry to see that, that we lack that, that sort of bedrock understanding uh, that we need to have about the way our system of government works. And so that brings us back to what? It brings us back to the reason that I'm here tonight, and that's the United States Constitution. We have three branches of government. You all know that. I mean, if you're enlightened, educated people, that's why you're here tonight, and I commend you for that. But um, it's well to review uh, what we have. That was a seminal document uh, that now is 227 uh, years old. Seminal document upon its formation is a seminal document. 227 years old, signed by 38 of 41 delegates to the Constitutional Convention during that blazing hot, it wasn't like anything like this past summer. It was a brutally hot summer in uh, Philadelphia. For any of you uh, history professors out there, you probably taught this, um, the political science professors. Days and days, uh, 100 days, really, uh, give or take, of ardent determinations, long days and nights. Um, the nights were occasionally fueled by lots of ale and Madeira wine, and some things even stronger than that, I suspect, in Philadelphia's tavern. Some things never change. Uh, but they made it through. They, they were literally closed up in Independence Hall. They shut the windows. And they, they put dirt uh, in front of the windows uh, to, uh, to, to, to block out uh, uh, prying eyes as these, as these men labored over uh, this document, setting out first uh, to, to try to reform or revise the, the, uh, the Articles of, of uh, Confederation uh, that, that basically uh, were so deeply imperfect uh, that they threw them out. And, and, and started clean sheet uh, designs on a, on a system of government. So over a summer, from May until this date in September, they created this document that is so enduring and, and so magnificent. And so we know then that Articles 1 and 2 uh, respectively created the Congress and the executive branches. Expressly designed within the Constitution was that these branches, are designed to be majoritarian and to reflect the will of the people. Popular elections, 
president was popularly elected, <laughs> the House of Representatives was, the Senate not yet uh, at that time, but, but at least based in, in the, um, the fact that, that uh, local state legislators uh, would, would appoint or elect uh, senators, so there was some degree of, of um, majoritarian and, and, and popular will that was involved in that as well. But then there was Article Three. Article Three created the judiciary of the United States, the branch of which, as I said, I am a privileged to be a member. And Article Three, within Article Three, the judicial branch was designed in a way that judges are not, are expressly not, to be responsive to the popular will of the people. Rather, we are to be responsive to the Constitution, to the Bill of Rights, as, as followed the, uh, the uh, Constitution. Very different, vastly different. That singular concept is, is, is utterly lost on most people who try to analyze, and, and people, frankly, who know better and should know better, uh, what judges do. At bottom, the judicial branch was designed to protect against, protect against the tyranny of the majority. We level the playing field introduce into the mix impartial arbiters who allow citizens to vindicate their constitutional rights. Now, as we know, in the centuries since then, the Constitution has survived great upheaval. A civil war, for example, that split the country in two, literally in two. Two world wars, massive world wars. The threat of nuclear disaster, civil rights battles, and most recently, the very stark and real threat of global terrorism. But our tripart uh, system of uh, government that the framers established in that hot summer in Philadelphia has endured, and I would suggest to you possibly has flourished beyond the framers' wildest dreams and hopes. So why is there a problem? What's, what's the, what, what then is the problem? So again, let me cast it in the context of, of what I do. As you could hear from what I said a moment ago, citing Mr. Rohr in particular, one of the most prevalent recent criticisms that I received uh, was that I was one single judge deciding a case and thwarting the will of the people of Pennsylvania, in the case of Whitewood, as expressed through their elected officials. This critique, uh, again, was accepted by many. It was expressed by opinion writers, uh, and again, it, it, it missed the point. It, it's, it's the point that's made, and you've read it, uh, those of you who are consumers of the news, of the arrogant judge off the reservation, untethered to uh, reality. It writes out of the equation something called judicial review, which is that judges are tasked and, in fact, bound since the 1803 case of Marbury versus Madison to conduct judicial review to test the constitutionality of laws. It's what we do. One person, three persons, nine on a Supreme Court of the United States, it's what we do. Now, to those who say that judges are not accountable, I would say this by way of a rejoinder. We are appointed by the President of the United States. We are subject to sometimes brutal confirmation uh, fights and, and the process that unfolds in the United States Senate. We must be confirmed by the Senate. Our decisions when we render them at my level are subject to two layers of appeal. And ultimately, if it is the will of the people, a, a, a difficult but possible process has been written into the Constitution that allows amendments uh, to the Constitution. Uh, they can overcome a judicial uh, pronouncement or determination or prohibition rendered by a, a, a judge or, or judges or justices, as the case may be, with which the, the majority of the people uh, disagree with. This system has operated, I would say, in a way that is effective and durable and good. And many times judges move ahead of popular opinion. It is, it is so because they are tasked to conduct judicial review grounded in the Constitution of the United States. Witness, in 1954, there's a famous case that you're all familiar with, Brown versus Board of Education. Up until that time, 
the concept of separate but equal prevailed in the United States. Separate but equal. Plessy versus Ferguson was the case from long ago. We actually had a country where it was acceptable to segregate blacks and whites. It was legal, it was lawful, it could be done. Hard to believe that today uh, in, in uh, 2014, but if you had polled in 1954, the majority of Americans, I will tell you, probably would have said it's just fine the way it is. The Supreme Court, ahead of public opinion, in Brown versus Board of Education said this must end. There can no longer be separate but equal. Nine to zero, that court ruled um, that there would be integration in the, in the subject school systems. And the law changed. It was a thunderclap. Unpopular as heck in its day, but, but an appropriate, considered a decision um, that, that drew fire, uh, but has withstood the, uh, the uh, test of time. My cases, as I said, uh, it, it occurs to me that, that history will treat them well. It's, it's written well after the facts, so we can't know that. But clearly, uh, the decisions that I rendered in both cases have, have jumped ahead of, of many segments of, uh, of public opinion. So I'm not here tonight to convince you that I was right in either or both of my cases, and I want you to understand that. You have, you have every right to disagree uh, with, with uh, either or both of my decisions. But I am here to tell you that we work at this, uh, that we try to get it right, that we rule without fear or favor or bias in any way, that we do not rule uh, with an eye to a benefactor. We're not tethered to some uh, political source. That is expressly not the purpose of, of the judiciary in Article Three of the uh, Constitution. And yet, these persistent misapprehensions about what we do remain. And I want you to consider these troubling facts. Over half of our citizens, when polled, believe that somewhere in the Constitution it expressly states, expressly states that we are a Christian nation. Most of our fellow citizens today, over half, again, cannot name all three branches of government. Some people, for example, think the judiciary is part of the executive branch. Recently, the Constitution Center conducted a poll, and in so doing, they learned that uh, only 15% of our fellow, fellow citizens can identify John Roberts as the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of the United States, but fully, 65% of our fellow citizens can name at least one American Idol judge. <laughs> Troubling. So even, if, you know, I, I expect an imbalance, and I didn't expect that much of an imbalance. So what do we do? I, I've happened along the way to become friendly with, with uh, a, a person who is a, a great hero of mine, Sandra Day O'Connor, former justice of the uh, Supreme Court of the United States. And, and she, in her post-justice uh, years, uh, having retired some years ago uh, from the high court, has, has worked very hard on the civics education area. And, and she has repeatedly said that we are, again, not, not my original thought or hers, but that we're suffering uh, via a lack of good bedrock civics education and knowledge about how our democracy actually operates. And, and, and sort of poignantly, uh, she, she buttresses that by saying, this is not, folks, something that is stamped uh, on our genetic material. You don't, you're not born into the United States of America or naturalized as a citizen, as a citizen and injected with a chip uh, that gives you this information. You have to learn it, and you have to relearn it through generations. And I'm afraid that we're not doing as good enough job a good enough job as we need to uh, in, this, uh, in this area. Now, why, why does this matter? Uh, does it matter because Jones is ticked off because people criticize his decisions in the judiciary? That's not, that's not it. I mean, that's part of it. I use that as a, as a, as a basis to illustrate the problem. The, the, the point is, if you don't understand your rights, if you don't get it, 
If you don't understand how the system works uh, in the United States of America, our system of government, you will lose your rights. You will not exercise them. You'll be shut out. You, you, you will not apprehend what you can do to vindicate uh, your constitutional rights because you could lose them. It happens. And that's why the doors to the federal courts are open to all citizens uh, in the United States. So in an open society, and this is indeed an open society uh, that, we, that we live in, uh, I, I implore you to understand how our system of justice operates. Uh, it, it, is, it is a vital thing, uh, and it, it is vital to perpetuating this open society in which we live. And I want to return uh, to our, our good friend, Popper, uh, one last time. Popper said, very sagely, true ignorance is not the absence of knowledge, but it is the refusal to acquire it. Well said again by Popper, a man uh, before his time and very wise, and that quote happens to fit nicely within what I'm saying to you tonight. So then, uh, on this anniversary of our Constitution, we should honor the work of the men who gathered in Philadelphia to draft it and to form this government that we live in. The word superstar hadn't yet been coined in 1787, but if it had, uh, is there any doubt that it would have applied to iconic figures like George Washington, James Madison, Benjamin Franklin, and Alexander Hamilton? Can you imagine what it was like to be in Independence Hall that summer, locked in that room with those fellows, Governor Morris of Pennsylvania, other people that were, as I said, the iconic figures of their age over, over the course of just months forming a new government. So allow me to close by suggesting that when we engage in discussion and debate about the issues of our time, including judicial decisions, we do so in the same fashion as these superstars of an earlier age, as enlightened, educated, and civil citizens of this greatest nation on earth. Because perpetuating our magnificent open society ensuring our survival as a nation, and the honoring of the memory of those who framed a Constitution of the United States that allows these things to endure, mandates nothing less, my friends. Thank you for having me. It was my pleasure. Now, um, I, I told my host that um, uh, at the risk of, of, of boring you, and I don't want to keep you here excessively, but uh, we've allotted some time for questions. I'll take uh, as many as my voice holds out and, and my stamina holds out up here. It's been a bit of a long day, but, uh, but um, I'll, if I can answer it, I will. Sometimes I can't uh, because of my position. I'll do that. I'll give you a non-answer with a smile if that's the case. But, uh, Okay, uh, yeah, why don't you take the mic? Uh, I mean, I can hear you, but I guess for recording purposes, you want to have people at the mic, so feel free, please. Yes, sir. I didn't mean to be first. <laughs> uh, I was wondering if you had any thoughts about why we as a public generally look at the um, protections of uh, the the uh, the institutions of of the government, like um, the uh, separation of powers and procedural due process, as inherently a good thing that's clearly under the Constitution, but we seem to have a tendency to be paranoid when we talk about um, equal protection or substantive due process as the avenues of judicial activism. Why, why don't we look at why don't we look at, at all of those things as 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 you mentioned earlier the protection of the individual against the tyranny? Well, of the I tyranny. wish we would, but but you know I'm not blind to the fact that that the the latter 
principles, you know, besides the, the you're talking about the, uh, uh, the branches of government and the separation of powers and checks and balances and things, that, that's a little easier for people to get their brain around. And, and, and to be sure, the, the other concepts, uh, due process, equal protection, uh, and the like, they, they are shifting concepts. Um, and and I, I, I would never contend that, um, you know, through history, again, let's go back to Brown versus Board of Education. You know, one Supreme Court in the 1800s finds that the Constitution supports separate but equal, Plessy versus Ferguson. Another Supreme Court in 1954 finds that it, it, that, that's flatly, uh, uh, you know, uh, anathema to, uh, to the, uh, the fabric of the, uh, of the Bill of Rights. So, you know, I, I think that um, the progression of the law uh, uh, as it goes through time is sometimes difficult for people to grasp, uh, sometimes different for, difficult for judges to grasp as well. So, um, uh, you know, I, I, I'm, I guess tonight my message is not that I want to make everybody a legal scholar and that I want to have them do a deep dive into constitutional law. I simply want them to understand better the process. I mean, I, if scholars have written and will write on the concept you've talked about, but I'm, I'm, I'm more process oriented than I am, uh, you know, uh, biases within the, you know, the, the, the concepts that you talked about. But it's a good question. Do you, do you mind a single follow-up? Sure. Okay, I, I promise. <laughs> um, <laughs> first of all, for what I'm about to ask, I, I want to pay, pay you the compliment of the way that you wrote Whitewood. I felt like you wrote Whitewood from the perspective that you knew a lot of people who are not used to reading judicial opinions were going to pick it up and try to understand what just happened in Pennsylvania. But I don't normally see that in the way judicial opinions are written. And if we're talking about a, a big difference between the, the way law is transacted in the courtroom versus public perception, do you think that judges should be doing more to make their decisions understandable for it's the really a, It's really an individual choice, and I'm not going to be so bold as to tell my colleagues that they should write in a certain way. <laughs> Some fair. judges will always write in a way that is, that, because it's the way they write. In fact, you know, it, it, it's something they picked up in law school where they think they need to write a, obtusely. Uh, and, and, I, and, I, and, I don't, I, and I don't, I don't do that um, necessarily. I try to write in plain English, and, and I strive to do that particularly when you have a case that is going to be consumed widely by the public. Now, on the crass side of the equation, uh, that decision, the Whitewood decision, was written about in Slate magazine. And, and uh, the writer was friendly, but uh, you know, he, he, had, he, he put something in that was, that, that was um, uh, a snarky comment that uh, in, in a number of the district court decisions across the United States, uh, the judges appeared to be engaging in a creative writing contest uh, competition. And, you know, and it's, you can't win. You know, I, I mean, I, 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 thought, I thought it was uh, well framed out, the decision, and it had a nice flow to it, and, and uh, um, you know, that, that it was digestible by people. They, they, didn't, they didn't pitch over face down after they got to the third page of the opinion, that it was actually somewhat interesting. Uh, to look at, but, but, but again, that goes to the, the educational uh, principles that I'm talking about. I mean, if you, you know, if, if, if shame on us. I mean, if we get too obtuse on that side of the, the spectrum, you know, no wonder people don't understand what we do. So, so I, I guess at the end of the day, I'm not going to tell another judge how to write, but I do see a trend. I think the judges are trying to write in, in, in plainer English, if you will. Uh, uh, than, uh, than trying to, you know, uh, outdo each other with, with the, uh, the sort of obtuse element. But Great. it's, again, a good thank, question. Thank you very thank much. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, anybody else has questions, I'd, I'd, I'd head up to the mics and we'll keep it flowing if you want to do that. Um, <laughs> as, oh. Go ahead. Go, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, as you said, I know Sandra Day O'Connor has been very exercised about you know some of the statistics you mentioned of people being uninformed about civics and about the Constitution. And I wondered, was there any organized effort, you know, by her and maybe with the rest of you on the judiciary, to do something to try to move the education oh, system yeah. to yeah. to really change? And and if so, how is it going? Well, she, she does uh, herself. She, she travels the country. She's almost a, uh, has the, 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 you know, the, uh, a, a, a fervor uh, that, that it betrays her 
octogenarian uh, uh, status uh, it, it, I admire her so much. Uh, that's, this is a passion of hers. She's developed um, programs um, that are available in schools that, uh, that are software uh, related uh, teach. I mean, she, she gets into schools, she does videos and so forth. We have a committee at the national level um, that, uh, that, that is directly designed and, and local court committees that are directly designed to, to foster uh, better uh, civics education. Um, that's why I'm here tonight. I mean, some of us feel bound to do this. Uh, we don't have to do this. Uh, we enjoy doing it at in, in, in bottom, but, it, but it's something that we feel very passionate about. So I think it is helpful. Um, look, I'll be candid with you. I mean, there's some judges th that, that not only don't want to do this, but they shouldn't. You don't want to let them out of chambers. Uh, uh, be, no, well, no, because, because they're just not going to be good messengers. Um, they know it, too. I mean, they're, they're great people, but, but, they're, but they, they can't, they don't have a passion to express it. They're on the bench, that's their job, and that's what they do. And, and uh, others of us hopefully have a, a, you know, a little bit clearer uh, message and a, and a passion to do it, and that's, that's why I'm here. So it's going, I think, better. It's not where we need it to be. Let's go over here, and then we'll come back to you, sir. Yeah. Yes, I want to thank you for coming here tonight. Um, I had uh, a question about the, um, the Dover case. Yeah. Uh, but I did want to mention, too, about the point of civics education. Uh, I thought it was just me, and then I learned that a lot of people around me didn't know all the stuff I didn't know either. <laughs> um, what I started to do in, in teaching myself was try to find out what is, what is important to me. And one of the things that I wanted to announce here is that I've learned that the Constitution isn't the Constitution of our government. It's the Constitution of me. It's the Constitution of you and you and you. This is a Constitution that belongs to us. And that makes it really important. So just wanted to offer that up. Uh, right. But about the, the Dover case, what is the basis of the decision for the Dover case? And that's a really broad. You got to be kidding. Uh, the 139 pages <laughs> is a really broad issue. But what I'm interested in is, was your decision based on the facts of the case only did no no the, no no did the stipulation no no decision is it, 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 I can I can answer the question and I want to do it as succinctly as possible first of right. all it's 139 pages and and you know for me to distill it down tonight the people would be running for the exits and I and I don't and I, and I don't intend to do that but yeah. um, you, you know did you read the decision no, I didn't, and I'd like to. Well, you should. I, I'm crazy. And, and, like I, and, I'm not, yeah. and I'm not trying to be flippant with you. I, I mean, <laughs> no, I, I'd I, like to, I, yeah. I want you to read it, because I, I think you'll get it if mm -hmm. you read it, because that, too, was written, I think, in a way that's easily digestible and understandable. But, but let me just say this. It, 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 is, it is what every judicial decision is. It, it is an application uh, of the facts to the law uh, as I found it. It's, I mean, that's implicit in the, the teachable moment is, that's what happened. I sat and listened to testimony for, it was a bench trial, I sat and listened to testimony for 40 days, uh, approximately. And um, when, at the end of the time, I received briefs on the, on the law. The, the seminal central question was whether the school board's policy violated the Establishment Clause in the First Amendment. Based on the law, based on the facts, as I found them to be, uh, based on precedent, as I said, I found that it violated the, uh, the uh, First Amendment. Game, set, match. Now, you know, that's 139 pages distilled into a soundbite, but that's, that's what it was. So I would, I would commend the decision to you when you have a chance. And it's every, you know, you can download it on the internet. And, 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 and you know, some parts are a little deeper than others because they involve scientific testimony. But um, other parts, I think, will give you a real good flavor, the summary, the, the, the end of the opinion where it, there's sort of a recapitulation. And you will also see a summary in exquisite detail of the testimony of the witnesses, including the scientific witnesses and the school board members, that I think shows you exactly what I saw at the, uh, at the trial. Okay? All right. Thank you thank very Thank you for much. your question. And thanks for coming. You're welcome. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Your Honor, thank you uh, once again for really such a, a remarkable speech. 
What I'd like to ask you about <coughs> concerns the interrelationship of the direction of the interpretation of law and public opinion. You mentioned uh, Brown versus uh, the uh, Brown decision. You suggested that this was, in some respects, ahead of public opinion in the US. Some critics of the Supreme Court, and I think possibly also yourself, might say, well, there's a sense in which the uh, balance of judicial interpretation seems to have moved things in a broadly liberal direction. On the other hand, in the US, since uh, the middle of the last century, there's been a remarkable and in some ways quite unexpected growth of the conservative movement, I mean, as an intellectual movement and so on. Suppose, and I'm not suggesting we should think of it one way or the other, but just suppose that it actually became increasingly dominant as a sensibility in the US. In your judgment, is this something that judges such as yourself and the Supreme Court would have to start to take into consideration? Or would your view be, no, uh, if there is really an opening up of a gulf between popular sensibilities and the general direction of the interpretation of the law, basically, if people want to change it, they, they can only legitimately do so by way of constitutional amendment. One can't expect uh, judges such as yourself or the Supreme Court to be responsive to that. Well, let me answer your question this way. Uh, that's a, that's a you know, kind of a complicated answer. Uh, it could lend itself to a complicated answer. Um, Believe it or not, you know, it, 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 on the federal courts, we, we, we don't sort of wallow in ideology. That's not, it's not what we do. Um, uh, it, it's, it's, it's not our purpose. We're all too human, of course. Um, implicit in what we do sometimes are our subconscious biases. I'm, I'm aware of that. Um, uh, certainly at the level of the Supreme Court, uh, there are more broad philosophical points. I always say elections mean something in terms of justices who are appointed to the Supreme Court. I think we all get that. But the court system can only operate. Um, we don't have the power of the purse. We don't have the sword. We can only operate based on our own integrity and, and, and the fact that, that, that people believe in us and, and that they, they're willing to abide by a system of laws. Uh, courts have to be careful what they do. And we keep using Brown as an example, but it is a good example because 20 years before Brown was decided, I would say, you know, in 1934, if a similar case had come to the Supreme Court of the United States, they could not have ruled the way they did. The people wouldn't have stood for it. There would have been an insurrection at that point. Would it have been the right thing? Arguably, yes. But the, but the, the public wasn't ready uh, for that kind of a sea change decision. So ahead of public opinion to a degree they may have been, but not that far ahead of public opinion. So, so it, 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 when you wonder what judges are cognizant of, it, certainly at that level at the Supreme Court, um, uh, sometimes incremental change works better. Um, and um, I, I will tell you that it's, it's going to be, it, 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 it is interesting to me, for example, in the question of same-sex marriage to watch the progression of same-sex marriage through the court system, my own court being one of the courts that had it. I think it's gonna be in the Supreme Court term for 2014 and 2015. I don't think any of the justices thought it would be on their docket this quickly. I think that, that they, they learned, for example, from Roe versus Wade back in 1973, that, that they might not wanna take the bold stroke so fast and let it percolate through the state system. I, I now see that, and they see, that they may not have that luxury because of the plethora of cases that are coming up. So now they have to decide, you know, and it's likely going to be a split decision. Do they want to take the bolder stroke uh, in this particular case? I, that's a little bit of an abstract answer to your question, but I hope it... But I the hope question it, is, if sensibilities move markedly in the other direction, would those considerations to which you've referred then start actually pushing the judiciary back? 
I'm not sure that it would. I, I'm not sure that it would because I think we're cyclical, and I think you know uh, this this system through all the years has withstood the test of time. You know, you have so-called conservative courts and so-called liberal courts. I think I think those terms are overblown and overused, and we can all cite examples of justices who didn't work out the way they were supposed to. But in the main, um, you know, I, I I went around the country speaking after the Dover case. And, and I would speak to college audiences and people would say, well, you know what they're gonna do with the Affordable Care Act. They're gonna strike that down. And, 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 and John Roberts is gonna lead the charge and, and take down the Affordable Care Act because he's an arch conservative and that's what he's gonna do. And I would say to people, you, be careful what you predict. And be, be careful what you say because one thing about courts is you, you, you ought not predict you're not there. You didn't read the briefs. You don't understand the facts. You didn't. You, you don't have the legal analysis at hand. So what happens? You know, the, the court decides the case, and John Roberts is a swing vote, and they uphold the Affordable Care Act. Again, you know, I, I, I'm not, I'm not a big trend guy as far as the courts are concerned. But thank you for your question. Thank you very much. Next. Yeah, I also want to thank you for uh, your talk. Much of which. I agree with very strongly, um, and and yet, as a popper scholar, I, I I I really don't understand what the judiciary doesn't get about falsifiability. <laughs> I put it that way because, as as you may know, um, Chief Justice Rehnquist wrote the same thing with the Daubert decision yes. uh, about the admissibility of expert testimony. So it's not really a question; it, it, it it's a comment. I mean, basically, the idea is this. In order for a theory to be regarded as scientific, it shouldn't be enough just that a lot of people believe in it, or even that a lot of scientists believe in it. There should be a way of testing it. And in order for there to be a way of testing it, there has to be a way of failing the test. There has to be something that might occur no, I... that would show the theory to be false. Right. That's all it is. Right. Get it. No, well, and, and what, what your point gets to, I know, um, among other things, and I'm not begging a response necessarily because I want to leave time for the other question, but, but you know, is, is that um, what science is, obviously. And, and um, uh, back in the, just to quickly review in the intelligent design case, um, intelligent design uh, basically proffers that there is an intelligent designer uh, they don't admit necessarily that that's God, but that there is an intelligent designer that, that, that created things, brought things into being. Uh, of course, uh, evolution uh, does not necessarily deal with the origin of life, but it does deal with the process uh, after the origin of life. And um, one of the problems as you analyze intelligent design is you, you, the falsification uh, issue, because uh, how, do you, how do you deal with the supernatural? Uh, and uh, uh, that was something that we, that we well, dealt with. I mean, just, just, just to, I mean, because m my sense about it is that um, it, it, intelligent design may not be science, but for a somewhat different reason, is that science was always the enterprise, the project oh, of explaining things let's let without other, appealing to the Let's let these other gentlemen ask questions, and we can, we can, we'll take that offline after we're, we're finished. But thank you. Great. Um, thank you. Another big thank you for your very stirring and provocative um, presentation here. Um, it's interesting, I think, that, that um, Brown is invoked so frequently, because when I think of Brown, when I teach about Brown and US history and other courses, um, one of the things that strikes me about Brown is that the decision that preceded it endured for 58 years. Yes. That Plessy endures for 58 years, which sort of demonstrates to me that, that pernicious and unjust Supreme Court decisions have the capacity to endure. Then we fast forward to the early 2000s, and we're sort of circling back to Popper. We get, we get a Supreme Court decision in the early 21st century, Citizens United that essentially says corporations are people pretty quickly followed up by a lifting of all, all limits on campaign contributions. 
my question, I guess, is, I mean, from my frame of reference, I look at Citizens United as somewhat analogous to, to Plessy, as a pernicious and unjust Supreme Court decision. My question, circling back to Popper, is do you think that, that Citizens United and subsequent rulings represent a kind of a threat to the open society? Well, I'm not gonna uh, be a critic of the Supreme Court, <laughs> no matter how much you want me to be. Uh, uh, it's the law of the land and it's a law I'd have to apply uh, if, if I was faced with a case that, uh, that uh, triggered a, a Citizens United type uh, analysis. Um, you know, again, um, it, is, it is a case that is, that, is, uh, that is deeply unpopular and it's contentious. I, I, you, you forgive me, I'm just not gonna wade into, uh, John Roberts is effectively my boss. Uh, uh, and uh, I don't want to so, have So my... judicial independence does have its limits. It does. <laughs> okay, I, thank, you know, thank I, you. I, I'd, I'd like to keep my chambers in the nice location it's in and not have my furniture moved out. So. Thank you very much. I, he would never do that, by the way, but uh, that's a joke. Uh, um, this too might be a question you might feel uncomfortable answering, but here in Pennsylvania, you know, we elect judiciary, the judiciary unlike mm -hmm. federal appointment yeah. process. Um, and there's been some conversation in the legislature that we might change that. Mm -hmm. Other states have a merit select, uh, a, do a merit selection process with retired judges. Others mm -hmm. have other processes. Um, do you have any thoughts to share about how you feel about the comparison of the two systems? I, I favor, uh, at the appellate level, that is the Court of Appeals, I, I favor an appointed system. I, I, I have no hesitation in saying that. Um, I understand the arguments for both sides. I, I believe, uh, you know, I had a political life before I got on the bench, many of us did, um, that, um, you know, I, I've often said that, that uh, um, uh, you know, a day or two before uh, an election, in Pennsylvania where there's a statewide judicial office up, you could stop somebody on the street and put a gun to their head and they couldn't tell you who the candidates are who are running. I, you know, it, it's a crapshoot uh, when you run. So, you know, to me, um, I, 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 I think that an appointed system, at the, not, not necessarily at the trial level, but the appellate level would be better. There, there are problems with that, uh, of course, because politics is always gonna factor in. You know, the appointer, who's the appointer? If it's the governor, governors of a, a particular party, you know, who, who's on the panel that selects the candidates that are submitted to the governor. But it has worked well in a lot of other states. So I, I would tend to favor that. Thank you. All right. Thank you all. Uh, my honor and pleasure. <laughs> nope. I'm sorry, what? Oh, okay, we'll take one more online. I'm, uh, a brief one. So we get these folks out of here. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Fantastic, hi. Fellow Dickinson grad, 05. Um, uh, I, had a, I had a question. I wanted to know how you handle people praising you for you and your decisions. Um, do you think you deserve it? Are you proud? In other words, I wholeheartedly agree with your two big decisions, uh, but I also understand that uh, that's because they already support my values. Um, in other words, were you just doing your job or were you doing a great job in what you did? <laughs> did somebody pay you? Uh, <laughs> what a great closer. You, in, other words, in other words, do I dislike the how did you get so great uh, uh, comments? Uh, no, listen, uh, it, yeah, I, I go home every night. Um, I put my pants on one leg at a time, same way everybody else does. I, you know, if you don't stay humble in these jobs, you have no business uh, being in the praise is great. As I, I've had my share of both. Uh, it's very nice when people come out to hear me speak. Uh, this is a great end of the night uh, talk, by the way, and it's, and it's lovely, but um, at the end of the day, uh, you know, we, we simply do our job. We're not working for praise. Thank you again, all. Appreciate it. <laughs>